Well, about 50 years ago, when I used to live in Padstow, uh, for my sins, I found myself being the vice commodore of the sailing club there. In fact, the sailing club used to be on the end of the uh, South Quay. Uh, you could probably, uh, you probably know where the harbour office is now. Well, that's where the sailing club had its little hut and a starting box that I made with my own hands, but that's another story. One of the great problems, of course, is that people come down to Padstow, they see it and it looks like a lovely sheltered estuary, and they off go sailing, and they've got no idea what they're doing. And, of course, it causes endless grief, uh, not only to themselves, but also to local sailors, fishermen, and uh, occasionally even the lifeboat. Anyway, we were down there one day, one Saturday morning, do you know, there was not a breath of wind. I've never seen the Padstow estuary look so flat calm in all my days. And in fact, the sailing club had decided it wasn't worth going out and uh, it would be far better just to wait for the customs house to open and go and have an early pint. And uh, that's what we were doing, in fact, when all of a sudden we saw a large estate car back up towards the slipway, pushing a big plastic tub of a boat. The driver seemed to be quite sort of, what's the word, uh, bombastic maybe, uh, and his wife was looking quite frightened and the children, they were looking terrified. They obviously had not been to sea or even on the estuary before. And the boat was being sort of zigzagged, reversing back up towards the slipway. And there, Pretty inexpertly, they hoisted the sails and uh, generally sort of made ready to reverse the boat down and into the water. Uh, quite what they were going to do, I had no idea, because there, as I said, there wasn't a drop of wind. And uh, I could see that the wife and the kids were really terrified. They didn't want to go sailing at all. And so I leaned over the harbour wall and I said, I don't think I'd go sailing today if I were you. And uh, the man said, and why not? And I said, well, today's the day of the great camel bore. This great wall of water that comes sweeping down from Wade Bridge, carrying all before it. I mean, you've probably heard of the seven bore, and that's big enough for people to surf on and that sort of thing. Well, this is the same. We have one in Cornwall. It's not quite as famous and maybe not quite as big. And he said, oh, when's it due? And I looked at me watch and I said, oh, about midday, because that was the time when the pubs opened. About midday, he says, oh crumbs well I've got time to get a quick sail in and I said well well you know I, 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 I'm not going out today and none of my friends are so you know you make your own decision and he thought oh well if all these locals aren't going out then maybe I better not and so the wife immediately smiled and the children stopped crying and I thought oh well, I've done my good deed for the day and then he said the ominous words We'll stay here with you and watch this great wall of water come sweeping past. Bugger it, I thought. How am I going to get out of this one? Anyway, they towed the water, the boat back up out, the, out of the slipway and they, uh, uh, they took the sails down and made it all secure again. And then they came and leaned over the harbour wall, looking out at the estuary. It was like glass. I have never seen water so smooth in my life. You could see every detail of the hills on the far side reflected beautifully in the water. If you looked down, it was just like looking at yourself in a mirror. I thought, well, how am I going to get out of this? And I was hoping that the wind might pipe up or something like that. Not a thing. Not a thing. I thought, this is going to be very hard to talk my way out of this. But then... At 30 seconds to midday, I saw a distant ripple on the surface of the water. It was about an inch tall, and it came sweeping down the estuary. And I thought, God is with me after all. And at the stroke of midday, heard on the chimes of the clock up on St. Patrick's Church there, this little ripple 
went past where I was standing. There it is, I said, there it is, the camel boy. He says, he's not very big. And I said, aha, wind against tide, wind against tide. And he turned to his wife and children and said, well, that's it, wind against tide, he says. And they went on their way rejoicing. And I thought, thank goodness for that. I can go into a pub and have a pint of beer in peace. And at that moment, I heard a voice from behind me saying, wind against tide my ass. I never heard anything like that in my life. And I turned round and it was old Tommy Morrissey, of course. You probably heard of Tommy, who was a great a fisherman, a teller of tales and singer of folk songs. And that was how he introduced himself to me. And that's how I introduced myself to him. And we were great mates ever since. It was just a question of who could tell the tallest story. Hello everybody, I've got another story for you today. This is a Cornish folk tale and it's called The Mermaid and the Fisherman. There was once a Cornishman, a Cornish fisherman, who lived on the cliffs above the beach. And one day he was walking along the shore. There had been a storm the night before and it was much too rough to take the boat out. So he wandered the shore looking for things that might have been washed up. Things like timber, glass, coins, anything that if he found it, he might sell. And as he walked, he heard the most enchanting sound. There was somebody singing. It was beautiful. He walked on and on until he came to a rock pool. And beside that rock pool was a mermaid. And she was combing her beautiful hair. Her eyes were the colour of the sea. She was startled. She stopped singing. Oh, I forgot the tide. I forgot the time. I was so busy listening to the birds singing. You look like a strong man. Will you carry me down to the sea? He picked her up easily and he walked down to the water and he began to wade in. And while he carried her, she gazed into his eyes. Come with me, come with me to the bottom of the sea. Live with me. I will help you to breathe. We will have a wonderful life. He was tempted. But just then he heard his dog barking in the distance and he turned his head. And as he looked, his wife was on the cliff top. I can't come with you, he said. I have responsibilities. I know you are a good man, said the mermaid. And he lowered her into the water and she swam off. And when he looked, he could see her in the foam a little distance off. And she called back to him. You are a good man. I will give you three wishes. Mmm, three wishes, he said. Oh, my first wish would be that I could heal because many of my family and friends have aches and pains. And my second wish was to be to have the power of finding, finding things that have been lost. And your third wish, said the mermaid. Ah, my third wish. My third wish would be that I could pass my powers to my son and to my son's son and my son's son's sons. Ah, I knew you were a good man. You are selfless. But remember, in nine years, I will come back for you. And then she dived beneath the waves and was gone. And no matter how long he looked, she didn't reappear. He turned and he walked back to the shore. And he walked back home. And when he arrived at his little house on the cliff top, he embraced his wife. And when the embrace finished, all his wife's aches and pains had disappeared. He soon became known as a healer, and people came from far and wide. He also had the power to find things. He found rings and treasure, anything that was long lost. The people were so happy to have these things returned to them. He was well rewarded. And nine years to the day of meeting the mermaid, he set to sea with his eldest son. It was a beautiful, calm day and the boat bulbed on the water. 
and the mermaid reappeared. Come with me, she said, come with me. The older man didn't hesitate. He stood up and he dived from the side of the boat. And his son watched, but his father didn't reappear. The son rowed the boat back to the shore and back home. And life went on. And yes, he did inherit his father's power. He could heal and he could find things. But every decade, one of his descendants was lost at sea. Perhaps it was to go and visit his ancestor and the mermaid in paradise under the sea. And to this day, that family still have the power to heal and the power to find lost things. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. About 55 years ago, one of my friends said to me, what are you doing here in Cornwall? And I said, it's a penance. And they said, for us or for you? And I said, you can be the decider of that, but it's all on account of St. Perrin. And they said, how on earth can that be true? And I said, it has to do with ancestry. You have to realize that in the old days, O'Connor was the High King of all Ireland. He was a powerful man. People only spoke to him if they had permission. They only spoke of him if they had permission. But you know, King O'Connor was a particularly hard done by chap. He only had 17 wives. I ask you, I mean, that's not really enough, is it? He decided anyway to get another 14 fiancés. So he had one for every day of the month. Perfectly reasonable, I hear you say. Well, when Perrin heard about this, I'm afraid he was not the wisest of men. Or perhaps he was just not the most diplomatic. He railed against King O'Connor from the pulpit. And of course, inevitably, King O'Connor got to hear about this. And so it was that the next morning, that when Perrin was just sitting down for his porridge, suddenly there was a bang on the door, a group of soldiers came in without being invited, and said, you won't be needing the rest of your breakfast. But I'm hungry, said Perrin. Don't worry, you won't be for long, they said. They took him back to the court of King O'Connor, where in under 15 seconds he was found guilty of any crime that you care to name, and straight away he was condemned to death. The poor chap, well, what can I say? Immediately, King O'Connor, it's a family trait, he got some famous hairy string, and he lashed Perrin to a millstone with it. And then he and his whole retinue watched while Perrin was being wheeled up to the top of the highest cliff that they could find. And they all gathered there. There was King O'Connor, his 17 wives, his 14 fiancés, and all his retinue there to watch the fun. Have you got anything to say? he said to Perrin. I can't swim, said Perrin. Don't worry, you won't need to where you're going, said King O'Connor. And with that, they threw the millstone off the cliff. Well, on the way down, I must say Perrin thought that his prostates are looking slightly less than optimistic. But when they hit the water, the millstone said to himself, Well, darn it, this is a holy man that's strapped to me here. I'd best not drag him to the bottom of the ocean. Best that I float and so it popped up on the surface again. And the hairy string that was binding Perrin to the stone said, this is a holy man that I'm binding. Best I undo my knots. And so the knots were instantaneously undone. It must have been a miracle, mustn't it? So here's the example, just like that. And of course, when the millstone hit the water, it did so with the most enormous splash.
But because Piran was a holy man, at the moment he touched the water, it became holy water. And that enormous splash reached up, and it splashed King O'Connor, his 17 wives, his 14 fiancées, and all his repertoire, and all his retinue. So in an instant, they were all baptised, and became good Christians on the spot. And as Perrin bobbed up to the surface, he realised that his work in Ireland was done. And he thought, where are some people that could do with a bit of converting and Christianity and that sort of a thing? And he immediately thought, ah, the citizens of Cornwall, that's where I'd best go next. And so he stood up on his millstone and invented surfing. A big wave came along and waving farewell to King O'Connor and his friends, Perrin surfed hanging ten all the way across the Celtic Sea until he arrived at Perrinporth. And there, as we know, he was welcomed with open arms, and he's been the patron saint of Tinners ever since. So that's how Perrin came to Cornwall, and that's how I came many years later to apologise on behalf of the O'Connor family. Thank you.